podcast now with Kara Goucher, author of the forthcoming book, The Longest Race. Kara, welcome to the MTA podcast. Thanks so much for having me. Off mic, I was just talking about how I'm such a fangirl. I started distance running in 2007. And so like you were one of the first people I kind of started following in the running world. And you've just been hugely inspirational to me. One of the things we always like to ask guests is how they got started as a runner, because everyone's story and the journey is so different. Um, so maybe you could talk about that a little bit and talk about who were some of your early influences as you continued running through middle and high school and, you know, kind of like that. Yeah. Well, my grandpa, Papa, he got me into running. He took me to my first race and he was a lifelong runner. Actually, this is mm -hmm. kind of funny. This isn't in the book, but when he was in his eighties, he ran on an alter G and he <laughs> called me and he was like, Kara, I just ran on this thing. Like you have to try. I was like, yeah, Papa, I know I've been running on one for like five years. Um, <laughs> but he just loved the movement and he's the one that got me into it. He took me to my first race and he loved to tell this story. I mean, the people at the retirement community would literally roll their eyes. My grandma would too, because she's like so tired of hearing this story, but that, you know, he's the reason I'm an Olympian because he brought me to my first race and I fell and he thought I would be upset and said, I was like, everyone's getting away from us. And he was like, for the first time he realized I was competitive, right? Mm -hmm. I was always really shy and stuff. So he got me into running and I just looked up to him so much my whole life and he loved running and he, he wasn't a racer, which I think is kind of interesting. He really ran for mental health and to feel good, better. And we bonded about that a lot later in life, just the feeling you get from running, but he got me into it and I would just run. It's not like I ran a lot. Like my son's actually on a team. Um, I just would run local races or if I was out at the cabin and he was going to do a short run, I would run with him like in my kids and everything. Uh, <laughs> and then, yeah, then I, in seventh grade, I found out like, it's like a sport that you can do. <laughs> and that's how I got into more competitive running. So you, you were talking about in the book, like your sisters had different sports. I mean, your family was very active. Um, but you know, kind of, you found like running was your thing. There was really no one in the family who was doing that. And so you kind of, you know, had experienced some success and felt driven in that. Um, and so middle school, high school, you know, who are the people that you looked up to in those beginning years? Um, I was super lucky to have an awesome coach who coached me for six years and he cult cultivated this team environment that was everybody matters and so I feel so lucky that I had teammates that were invested in my success because it helped the team's success. And then I was invested in their success. Honestly, I'm still friends with the girls on my cross country team. We get together once a year at someone's house or this past year, we actually left so that nobody had to do any mom duties or anything. <laughs> yeah. And we went to Arizona. Um, but I feel so lucky. I really looked up to my teammate, Amy Hill, who's now Dr. Oldenburg. She just, I really looked up to her. She just uh, like right away started running well at the high school level, even though she was only in seventh grade. So I really looked up to her. And then as I started to follow the sport a little bit more, I was always obsessed with the Olympics. So I knew Carl Lewis, Jackie Joyner, Kersey, Flojo. I had their pictures in my bedroom. My sister would give me anything running related, but it really wasn't until I saw Lynn Jennings running the 10,000 meters at the 92 games. That was the first time I thought like I made a connection because, mm -hmm. you know, I can't sprint and I can't jump. <laughs> I can't throw anything. <laughs> so I worshiped all these other people, but I didn't really relate to them. I just like loved them. But that was mm -hmm. the first time I thought like, wow, I wonder if that could be me sometime. Mm. Wait, how old were you when you were thinking that? I was 14. Nice. Wow. And I think it is, it's almost like you have to kind of relate to people on a certain level and like kind of think like that could be me. And like, start to claim it for yourself, at least the dream initially, you know, even though the, the road is still uncertain. Yep. Um, you know, we recently talked with Lauren Fleshman about her new book and the prevalence of disordered eating and that often, per, you know, goes along with performing at a high level. How did you navigate a world where your self-worth is often linked to your weight and your performance? It was hard. I mean, I we I had a high school teammate who had a very severe eating disorder and she was mm. in and out of the hospital. So I saw it really young. And then I went to Foot Locker National Cross Country Championships a couple of times and I saw a lot of those behaviors there. Um, my girls on my high school team, like we made this pact, we were going to eat and we were going to be healthy. But when I went to college and I didn't have that support system anymore, 
Um, and I was looking around who's winning the NCAA. Like nobody has to tell you even you should lose weight, right? Like mm. you see it and it's been modeled for me. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely had some issues in college um, because the seeds had been planted for so long and I lost, I lost those. I mean, I had great collegiate teammates, but I lost those girls that were like, like we would literally make Twizzlers into saying food rules and take a picture and then eat it all. You know, I lost those girls. Like they weren't with me anymore. So I think our sport, it's, it's, it's everywhere, but it starts a lot younger than we want to admit. And it, it is a tough sport. Even when you're looking at professional athletes, they are lean and mean. And it's hard it's, as a kid, you see that or a teenager or whatever as like, look how lean they are. I have to get skinnier. But the reality is they've, their bodies over time have developed into that and, and they don't look like that all year round. Right. Mm. So, um, yeah, I struggled with an eating disorder like a lot of people. I was, again, really lucky that my boyfriend at the time, who's now my husband, would have like none of it. And then I even went home and my mom, you know, was like, I'm worried about you. This is getting out of control. And my college coach, Mark Wetmore, also pulled me aside and said, this is going too far. So I was lucky to have people that were looking out for me and helped me get it into control, like get it under control before I lost control of it. Yeah, there's an anecdote in the book where Adam offers you a Dorito chip. <laughs> yeah. And you just didn't want to eat the chip. You really had a struggle. No, with, I did like, not want to eat it. But he he was like, just have a chip. Just have a chip. And I was like, no, I'm fine. I'm fine. Even though I was not fine. I was about to pass out. I was so hungry. We're talking one chip, not a bag of chips. No, no, no. A chip. And then he actually said, eat the fucking Dorito. <laughs> and I remember being like... Oh, I have to eat the Dorito. Like he's watching me and I hated every moment of it. But that was sort of the beginning of turning things around because Adam ate like a normal person. He ate when he was hungry. He never measured anything. He didn't count calories. I mean, I was like counting calories on the side. So that one Dorito, it was horrible, but that was actually the beginning of a shift um, because he ate normal and he was the best runner in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it really started to, I started to wake up to, you have to feel your body, but it's really, really hard. And one thing I also, on this topic, I feel like a lot of times we'll say, well, they have a lot of eating disorders or this or that. And we kind of shame them. Nobody wants to have an eating disorder. It's horrible. You think about it all the time. It's all you can think about. And so I don't ever want to shame anyone who has an issue. I just want to say it's really hard and I, I get it and I feel for you and hopefully you'll overcome it. Right. Yeah. Well said. So you have that pressure that you put on yourself and, and then, um, like our conversation with Lauren last week, sometimes the environment makes it even worse because you have coaches who say things and you have systems, you know, coaching systems, I guess, designed by men and for male athletes that don't take into account the needs of females and female physiology. And we have a whole culture that's based around, you know, ideals of female beauty, the cult and of beauty, right? Weight standards and all of that. So I guess we'll get right into it here. The, the, um, subtitle of the book is inside the secret world of abuse, doping and deception on Nike's elite running team. Of course, we're talking about the Oregon project. So what was the Oregon project for those that have never heard of it? And, and maybe we can dive into the abuse, doping and deception and, and what, you know, sort of the, the, the meat of the book is about. Yeah, I'm so, curious, like what it was like to be invited to join the team, because at the time, you know, you're out of college and like, it's a very uncertain world, you know, to make it as a professional runner. Seems like a dream, a, a dream a, a job, right? Opportunity of a lifetime. A hundred percent. That's exactly what it was. Um, I had been struggling. I had told Mark Wetmore, my college coach, he had been coaching me. I couldn't stay healthy. I was like, I have to try something new. Adam was in the same, in the same boat. Like he was like, I, we have to try something new. We didn't have kids. And we started traveling around and talking to other coaches. We went to Wisconsin. Um, but when Alberto called and flew us out there, this was something I had never seen before. The Oregon Project was, it was, it really was groundbreaking. It was professionalizing distance running and making sure you have body work, um, you know, ART therapy, massage therapy, PT, all the different any kind of equipment you could ever imagine, whether it's an Alter-G or an underwater treadmill or a cryosauna when those came, like everything was accessible to you. And so 
to be honest, he really wanted Adam, not me, but I was just sort of like part of the deal. Um, <laughs> And so as the first woman on the team, but, you know, I remember being there and talking to Dan Paff, who was only there for a few months, but he said, I, I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And he's like, what are you afraid of? And, and the truth was, I was afraid that if I went there where I had everything at my fingertips and I didn't make it, I had to accept I wasn't as good as I dreamt I was. Right. Mm. So it was a little scary to go, but it was an opportunity of a lifetime. And, you know, it just, I had never seen anything like it. There was like a Nike house where all, it was all at altitude, like uh, less oxygenated air being pumped into the house, two underwater treadmills in the backyard, a table inside the room for constant body work. I mean, it was just someone who had been injury prone. It felt like maybe this can save me and bring me back from the dead, which essentially it did. And we're talking about like Nike campus, unlimited funds Nike has. This is like the, the Caesar's palace of, of a running and training facility, right? Yeah. Like my, I had a locker in the Lance Armstrong fitness center. That's where I went every single day to drop off my stuff. Then I would go run on Ronaldo field or the bow field or the Michael Johnson track, which has a forest in the middle. Then we'd go back to the Lance to lift. Eventually we had our own private um, organ project area in the Lance where we could get massage, where we had the cryotherapy, where we had an ultra G. I mean, like anything you could think of was there and it wasn't like a drive away or I have to go visit this place because I need therapy. It was just like, get out of the car, park the car, walk in and everything you want is there. Hmm. And the idea was that an American had won the Boston marathon in, in forever and, and sort of kind of to like to revive American yeah, prominence I, I, in the I believe they had been watching um, Alberto and maybe Tom Clark had been watching the Boston Marathon and uh, there was an American in the top 10 and people were going crazy and they were like, why are we celebrating this? Like, we want more. So it started in 2000 and there was some success. Dan Brown made the Olympic team in 2004 in two events, the marathon and the 10,000, um, but it hadn't achieved the heights they had wanted. And so, you know, part of the allure for us was like, we were the first NCAA champions that had been recruited to this team. And if, if, if these other athletes are successful, what could we do? Right. I mean, it was, it was an incredible opportunity. And of course there were some sour things along the way, or there would be no book. Um, but there was also a lot of excitement and good things as well. So you experienced a really devastating loss of your father at a young age, and then you had a really tough relationship with your stepfather do you think those wounds kind of set you up to be looking for that stable father figure and, you know, kind of start mistrusting yourself and your own intuition when it came to being coached by Alberto? Definitely. My dad died when I was young. Mm -hmm. My mom was remarried for 10 years to someone who did the best he could, but who was a little bit, um, had a temper, which made me not afraid, but always a little tense. I hate conflict. I hate it so much. I still do. Mm. Um, and I think I was always looking for that person. And the first year there, I didn't get that from Alberto. You know, it was like, he was just a nice guy who wanted to help me. But definitely from 2006 on, he took a much bigger role in my life. And he called himself a father figure. And mm. he would call my mom and tell her that he loved me like a daughter. And so a thousand percent because that coach line had been blurred to also feel like my, like a father figure, an actual father figure. I think looking back, that was very unhealthy. Um, and it, it made things that happened. It, it made me excuse them away over and over and over again, because I, I literally loved him as a father. Mm -hmm. So looking back now, do you think there were warning signs? Like, do you think some of that was by design to kind of get you to trust him more and kind yeah. of grooming of sorts? <clears throat> it makes me sad you know, I've been in, I've been in a lot of hearings and testifying where people say I was groomed and it makes me sad because mm -hmm. I do, I do believe that Alberto cared about me a lot. Mm -hmm. And I think he's just a complicated person. Um, mm -hmm. I know there was a part of him that did a hundred percent love me like a daughter. Mm -hmm. Um, but unfortunately there were lines that were just crossed. So mm -hmm. I don't know that he came in it with this m manipulative plan. Um, but definitely my insecurities were capitalized on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So during the first part of your professional career, you focused on the track. What distances did you run and what were some of your favorite achievements on the track? Because I know that was kind of your wheelhouse. <laughs> yeah. I love the track. Um, 
so much. I still love it so much. Sometimes I think I moved to the marathon too soon, but mm. I had run the, th- so I'm old. So we had the 3000 at the NCAA championships when I was in college. Hey, we're the same age. So okay. we're not old. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm like, that was a thing. We ran it outdoors. Um, and people are always like, what? Uh, but yes. Yeah, so we, I loved the 3000 because I didn't have enough like sprint speed for the 15, but the 3000 is basically like an extended 1500 where, and so I really love that event. And then I moved up to the 5,000 and I really love that event too, but that was it. I didn't want to go any higher than that. And when Mm -hmm. I started running for Alberto, he started talking about the marathon and I would always just be like, I'm not going to run the marathon. I grew up volunteering at grandma's marathon. I've seen my (laughs) aunt and uncle, they can't walk the next day. Like that is not for me, you know? Uh, but he kind of always was like hinting that that's where I would be best. He's the one that got me back into the 10,000. I had run one 10,000 before that was a complete disaster. Like I actually walked during mm-hmm. the race and he was the one that encouraged me to get back and like try again. And so, yeah, I really focused on the 5,000, 10,000, but I would race, you know, an, uh, 3,000 here if they had one, or I would run the 1,500 if I could get in because I obviously wasn't that good at it. So I raced a lot of different things. I even raced a few 800s, but really I was good at the five and the 10. (laughs) And the dream you had as a girl to be an Olympian came true. You competed in two Olympic games on the track, right? One on track and then one in the marathon. Mm -hmm. That's right. So when it came to marathon training, um, I'm curious, like what was the training philosophy? I mean, I know you're probably running a high mileage, right? Like hundred miles a week and or more. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like work, 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 just outwork the competition. Was that kind of the, the ethos there? Yeah. The first marathon I ran was New York in 2008. And literally from my final of the 5,000 to the New York City Marathon was exactly eight weeks. And I think in a weird way, that was good because we couldn't We didn't have enough time to overcook it and, or for me to like really overthink everything. And I loved that training block so much. It no one else on the team was running the marathon. Alberto biked with me almost every day. I, I loved it. And I think my farthest run was 22 or 23 miles. So I still had a lot of fear of like, can I go those extra three or four miles? I had a lot of fear about it, but I loved the training block. And I remember being sad the night before the New York, New York City Marathon because I was like, it's over. Like I love had loved these past eight weeks. Um, but yeah, it was 100 miles. So I had never run 100 miles a week before. So I basically took a week of cross training and relaxing after the Olympics. Then I went into five weeks at 100 miles and then two weeks tapering down. And then I just went for it. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> I trained a lot more for the marathons after that than I did the first one. Little as you know, that would be a hundred miles would be your baseline and yeah. be like 135 <laughs> yeah. a week. Yes. Yeah. I, I, I thought a hundred was like so much. And then I started running for Schumacher and it was like a hundred is nothing, but yeah. And so when you, when you finished, was it just as tough and miserable as you thought it would be? It was so hard. I can't even tell you, like (laughs) I was yo-yoing about halfway through, like, I don't know if I can do this. Like Alberto said the first half would just go by in like a blink. And I was like, that's not happening. I'm feeling every step. And I was kind of yo-yoing, letting the lead group break, break away from me. And then actually this totally crazy thing happened where I thought of my dad and I attached myself back onto the lead pack. Mm. And then, um, but with like three miles to go, everything in my body started screaming at me and it kind of worked its way up. First, it was like my calves started screaming, then my hamstrings started screaming, then my back. Mm. And I kid you not, I didn't know the course that well. And I was like, I, ha- I have, to have to be done. I'm in so much pain and I was throwing up a little bit and I was like, this has to be oh. done. And I was looking for a place and it was less than a mile from the finish line. So thank <laughs> God. I didn't drop out, but it was really hard. Wow. And mm-hmm. it's, you know, as soon as I finished, I was like, I'm never going to do that again. And then of course, within 20 minutes, I was like, but, but what if I hydrated better? And what if I train more? You know, we all yep. we're yeah. crazy, right? We finished, we're like never <laughs> again. And then it's like literally 20 minutes later, you're thinking about like, well, if I had done this and done this and done that. So by the, that night I was ready to commit to another marathon. That mm. runner's amnesia kicks in. Oh, it's so <laughs> quick. I mean, there's so many pictures of me like crying to Adam afterward. And I was like, that was so horrible. I hate it. And then, yeah, literally that night I was like, should I run Boston? So, <laughs> yeah. And you write about just how amazing the crowds are and the fan support, the course support. And so when, when we see that here on, sitting at home on our couch, when we watch, you know, you run and uh, in the past and when we watch other elites, 
we think, man, it just looks so awesome. But then in the book, you write about how you're afterwards, after making it on the podium in Boston and in New York, your coach doesn't celebrate with you. He just kind of like, I don't even know if you're good at running. That's that's that was the the sentence, right? Yeah, I think that was a, my third marathon at the World Championships. He's like, I just don't know. Like, does she have what it takes? And there, and he and my uh, who I thought was a licensed sports psychologist, but wasn't there, having a conversation right in front of me. I think the medal Man. in Osaka. I won a medal at the World Championships in 2007 in the 10,000 meters, and it was sort of a blessing and a curse for Alberto and I because. I think that it just raised the level of expectations so much. Um, Whereas when I won the bronze, everyone was like, oh my God, it it was amazing. But then that sort of became the new standard that was expected. So Mm -hmm. New York, he was disappointed. He felt like I let Paula go and he actually changed his flight and flew home early. And then in Boston, you know, I didn't follow his race plan, which was don't take the lead till you turn on Boylston. And here's the thing I'll just say to athletes and coaches, if they're listening, you can plan as much as you want, but the athlete is in the moment and you have to trust your athlete to make the right choice. But it Mm -hmm. caused me to be like, should I be doing this? Should I not be doing this? Instead of, you know, I don't have a lot of racing regrets. I feel like I got everything out of myself, but that's a race I do regret because I was wrestling with, I really want to go, but it's so early. I don't know what to do. Um, Yep. And so, that, yeah, yeah, that takes a lot of mental and emotional energy. And when you're already pushing yourself physically so hard, you know, that really can be draining. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I was like in my head so much. And then finally, I just couldn't take it. And I was like, mm-hmm. I'm going to go. And then I just took off. And <clears throat> honestly, I felt better immediately because I'd kind of been chopping my stride. Yeah. But then someone from the press truck and I chose not to put their name in the book. Um, you're welcome. But um, they told me that I was running really fast and I should be careful. And I kind of slammed on the brakes. And that's the regret I have. I don't regret taking the lead, even though that wasn't the race plan. My regret is that instead of just trusting my gut, which was saying, open it up, this is the time. Mm -hmm. I slammed on the brakes and it created this little pack. And then when it came time to kick, the legs just weren't there. And it's, mm-hmm. and it doesn't, it doesn't mean I would have won. I probably still could have been third, but I, you know, I wish I trusted my gut. Mm. Might not be the first time someone on the course has messed up, you know, the, <laughs> the ranking, like the duel in the sun, the, the bikes didn't get out of the way for Dick Beardsley. And mm-hmm. yeah. Have you ever watched video from that? Yeah. There people are like in, like, I've never experienced that. Like I always ran on the rail because I felt, I could feel the energy. It mm-hmm. would make Alberto nervous it later on, made Jerry Schumacher nervous, but I would run as tight as I could because I felt like I could take that in, but like they were behind a barrier. They weren't like coming in, in our way. Mm-hmm. And that footage is crazy. The people just in the street while they're trying to <laughs> outkick each other in a marathon. Yeah. <laughs> Thank goodness for the barriers. Now yeah, he's seriously. Right. Yeah. <laughs> the things we take for granted, yeah. like <laughs> hydration, fueling totally, stations. Totally, all those things. Yeah. Crowd control. <laughs> crowd control. <laughs> so I remember I was pregnant with my youngest son at the same time you were pregnant with your son. In fact, they were born six days apart. Oh, wow. That's- Sounds kind of stocky, I know, but, yeah, <laughs> but I really, I really drew inspiration from you in the fact that you came back quickly, you returned to racing, and now, of course, reading your book, I realized that you didn't have a choice in that. Um, you know, Nike executives told you that your pay wouldn't be impacted by pregnancy, and they used you for PR during your whole pregnancy, and then, of course, they suspend your pay. Um, talk Without of, telling you, yeah. Without right? telling you. <laughs> I mean, it's just, it's just so maddening. I mean, you know, I know you're not the only Nike athlete or athlete in general that's dealt with this, but it's just so maddening to think about. Um, Can you talk about what that was like? Um, You know, it's like, uh, you don't need any more stress when you're pregnant. And here you have all this like doubt swirling around about your livelihood. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It was very stressful. And honestly, I took it very, very personally um, because this was a brand I was completely loyal to. And I thought I was in the Nike family and I thought that I always would be. And I took, I, you know, I did all the appearances they asked me to do, which was in over 20 during that time. Mm -hmm. I, they announced my pregnancy to the world. I didn't post ever on Facebook about it until this article ran, which was on Mother's Day when I was halfway through my pregnancy. So they were, 
heavily involved with how my story was being told as a pregnant athlete. And, you know, it was my financial advisor that called and was like, uh, you didn't get your quarterly payment. And at the time I thought nothing of it. I thought, well, it's European mm-hmm. racing season, like Capriati's probably over in Europe and he hasn't been able to sign off on it. Mm-hmm. And so when my agent finally got a hold of them and said, you've been suspended and I don't know for how long, I was completely shocked. And I hate fighting and I hate Mm -hmm. conflict, but I felt like it was wrong. And Mm -hmm. I felt it was like the first time I really stood up for myself when I was a Nike athlete. And of course it didn't go anywhere. Like I still (laughs) ended up being suspended, but um, it really was the beginning of me questioning, do I want to represent something that I don't believe in has the same beliefs as me? But yeah, it was Mm -hmm. crazy because my picture was everywhere. Um, yeah. And a lot of it that was orchestrated by Nike, but I was I was not being paid. So hypocritical of them. Mm, They're yeah. using you as a marketing asset. They're expanding the brand to women and to pregnant athletes with you as the face of it. Right. And then, and then they, they don't pay you and they don't even tell you. No, Just, they don't even tell me. And then when I was you, meeting with different people from Nike, they would say, well, you know, we pay you to run, not, not do appearances. And I'm like, but actually appearances are in my contract. So it has to have some value or it wouldn't be in my contract. But also I was told, do what we ask you and this won't be an issue. And it was a big business learning lesson for me because they kept saying, well, I kind of remember that, but it's not in writing. But again, I thought that I was in this family Mm -hmm. and I didn't think I needed to get anything in writing. And it just became... So like Alberta was telling me that I was fixated on money and I needed to just move on. And it was just a really icky, icky time in my life. But that is when I was, I decided that I would not resign with Nike. Mm. Contract was up and it was still years away, but I was like, my contract's up, I'm leaving. And that was kind of the straw that broke the camel's back. So in a way it was, you know, it was good because it kind of gave you that, that impetus to take your power back. Yeah. But the fact that Nike still, I don't know what the terminology exactly, but they were, you know, if you decided to sign with someone else, they could match that. They had like first option on you. Yeah. They had 180 (laughs) days to match any offer I had. And, um, or, or I had to just wait 180 days. So Mm -hmm. when I did leave fast forward two or three years, three years, two years, I don't know. Um, they, you know, I, I was like, if I have to wait 180 days, I will wait 180 <laughs> days. I, you know, I had to get them to release me and, you know, they played games there too, waiting. And, but then they finally did release me and I was free. I love the part of the book when you decide that you want to sign with Wazell, you know, because you just really believed in that company and their, the brand and just what they were doing for women. And, you know, and then Nike has the option to match that. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we can match the, yeah, the they're like 20 K we got that. <laughs> But then you're like, and 2% of the company. Yeah. <laughs> that was like such a coup there. That was, yeah. yeah. It was like, you can't match it. And I actually, this isn't in the book, but the sports marketing person from Nike said, well, I could pull their financials and I could match it, but I'm going to mm. let you go. It's clear. This is where you want to be. And I was just like, whatever. Yeah, right. I was, you know, I would have waited 180 days and I don't, it's not even like, this thing out of spite. It was just, Mm -hmm. you don't, we don't have the same values and I'm not going to resign with you. I just won't do it. It doesn't matter what amount of money you offer me. I'm not going to sign with you. And by that point you had moved on from Alberto's coaching to Jerry Schumacher. So, you know, you had kind of gotten away from the toxic abuse that Alberto, um, Mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of that power that he had over you, but still there was like that overarching, you know, the Nike executives and this, their whole culture that was really toxic. Yeah. I mean, I was still a Nike athlete. So even Mm -hmm. though I wasn't with the Oregon project anymore, all the people above me that I dealt with before were the same people. And, you know, I'm grateful that Jerry Schumacher took me on and that Chelaine allowed me to come when I was trying to figure out what to do. When I said, I cannot do this anymore. I'm leaving Alberto. I mean, there's some big name athletes that you guys know of that said no, that I could Mm. not join their team, which I understand. In the moment, it felt so hurtful. Um, But in the end, it worked out because Jerry said he would coach me and Shalane said I could join the team. And um, I was grateful for that opportunity because at that time, I was a little bit, people questioned me. 
which I didn't Mm -hmm. even realize until I started the whole process. So that was great that Jerry took me on. And then, and then it was like, I was able to just leave, leave, leave Nike Mm -hmm. for good. So let's just go back to the, uh, the Alberto era for a second. Of course, he's got a lifetime ban from coaching in the U S because of doping. You mentioned Nike had a building called the Lance named after Lance Armstrong. I'm guessing that has a different name now. Yeah. I think it's called the sports center. Um, and Alberto had a building as well, which was the name was taken off, uh, a few years ago. And I, I don't know if it's been renamed either. Uh, I think they realized maybe this isn't the best idea. Now they're just yeah. kind of leaving the buildings, but <laughs> how does doping work? All right. For, for the uninitiated like myself, you know, um, like how do, how do athletes dope? You mentioned, um, in the book that there was a runner who had finished first at a marathon that you did. And Alberto says, she's dirty. And you're like, how do you know? Like he, there, you, there was just a feeling he had, I'm like, what, what does it mean to be a dirty, dirty athlete and how, what, what, um, supplements or whatever are people using to cheat in, in marathons, for example? So I think when you're in the marathon scene or just the elite running scene or probably any endurance sport, you, there is like a process of, of climbing up the ranks, getting strength. You can't become a marathoner overnight because it takes years of, of building your body up. I mean, there are a few exceptions, but in general, you see people go through the track, really build up, go through the 10K, build up more, and then they go to the marathon. So I think you can kind of mm. see when someone comes out of nowhere, um, you know, the media loves that because it's super exciting, but I think a lot of athletes feel like, uh, that's not how it works. So I think mm. we kind of know, and, and yeah, Alberto had referenced someone who ended up being dirty, that she was cheating. But I, you know, I think, there's the big things, people who obviously blood dope, who are obviously taking EPO, things like that, that help them recover. So the EPO thing is it helps your body produce more red blood cells. So therefore you recover faster. So you can do, let's say in a seven day week, if you're a clean athlete, you can do one medium session and two hard sessions. But if you're recovering really well, you could get four hard sessions in a week. So Mm -hmm. it's not that the EPO makes you better, as much as it's the way that it helps you recover. So you can train at a level that's not humanly possible. And so Mm. then you don't need to take the EPO when you're competing because you, it's the workouts and all the work you were able to do, which is now helping you. So Mm. the, and then there's blood doping, which is the old fashioned way, which is still around as we know, where you take out your blood, save it. And then when you're trained and depleted, you put your fresh old blood back in. Then of course there's, there's, and that's what Lance was doing, right? That's what Lance was doing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. He was also taking EPO and testosterone and, and <laughs> everything. I'm, yeah. Yeah. He was also doing a lot of stuff, but that's like old classic, um, blood doping. But, okay. um, there's also testosterone, which helps you recover quicker. Um, and, and people don't think that how that would apply to endurance athletes. It's not because you want to get big and huge. It's like you take it after a hard session and you recover quicker. So, mm-hmm. um, those are like the main things also HGH. But so for me, I, I believe that it's my opinion that my team that I was on the Nike organ project was, was microdosing with certain athletes, which means that you can be tested by the U S anti-doping agency from 6 AM to 11 PM. But if you microdose, you just take a little amount. It can be in your system to where if you did get drug tested at 6 AM, it's not going to trigger a positive. And, Mm. but you're still getting the benefits. You're still recovering quicker. You're still sleeping deeper. And so that's what I believe was happening with the group I was with, not flat out blood bagging it, you know, Mm -hmm. um, but little things that wouldn't, wouldn't create a positive test, but would create a lot of advantage. And when it comes to testosterone, some of it also can be applied topically, right? As a cream. Yeah. So Alberto had androgel. I I would live with my husband and I would live with him when we would travel and he would have it out. I mean, it would be out in the middle of our condo. And this is the stuff where I look back and I just cringe because I, it shouldn't even be around an athlete. It's against the rules to have it even be around an athlete. Mm -hmm. Um, but you know, he told us it was for his heart and his health and I believed everything he said. So it's, it's, Mm. it's, he's disputed. He used it on anyone. It is not disputed that it was there and that it was around us all the time. And that's another way you could microdose. You could rub it into someone, um, and they would get a benefit without testing positive. And so, and he was very interested in testosterone levels. He was always checking the boys 
my husband included. I think I, there's an email in the book where he's worried about his testosterone levels. And so that was one particular hormone he was pretty interested in. Mm. And there's ways to get around cheating. Uh, I didn't know previous to reading this, right? Like was a saline IV or something that you can take? Yeah. So you can, you're not allowed to have an IV unless there's a therapeutic use. For instance, you're super dehydrated or sick or something like that. But using IVs before competitions or after you have been doping, it flushes your body and hydrates it to a level where the concentration then in your blood is less. So uh, if you've read Tyler Hamilton's book, which is called The Secret Race, he talks about how, you know, they would give themselves IVs if they knew drug testers were coming because it would dilute the concentration in their blood. Look, I know way more than I ever wanted to know about this stuff. I used to be, <laughs> I used to be little and I'd be like, oh yeah, the the Russian whoever's are, are doping and I'd pretend to take a pill and be stronger. I had no idea how any of this stuff worked. And mm. it was sort of, you know, I learned more as I went through the sport, not necessarily in the organ project, but um, as I grew up through the sport more and more and start in red stuff and people would test positive and it's just a very, it's a huge problem. It's a huge mm. problem in our mm. sport. And I, as sadly, I think it always will be. People are always mm. going to be willing to push the boundaries to win and yeah. it's, it's a problem, but we can keep knocking it off at the knees if we keep speaking up and if we see something, mm -hmm. say something and all that kind of stuff. Exactly. How scary was it to, you know, come to these realizations and then realize that the endocrinologist that you were working with was also working with Alberto and, you know, realizing like bringing your medical records up to scrutiny and thinking like, what if something is found and you inadvertently, you know, you weren't trying to cheat. What if something was found? After I went to USADA, Adam and I together the first time I told them, there's a possibility that he put testosterone on me mm -hmm. and I need to know if it's true because if it's true, it destroys everything I accomplish and I can't, I can't live with it. Mm -hmm. And that was very hard. A lot of yeah. sleepless nights. I'm serious. Just being so terrified that I was going to have to tell Papa and I was going to have to tell my mom and I was going to have to tell my grandma. Mm -hmm. Um, and I had a hard time getting my medical records. Um, you know, Dr. Brown wouldn't send them. Nike wouldn't send them. Finally, once they secured them, they were able to go through with them. And I remember just flat out asking the CEO of USADA, United States Anti-Doping Agency, saying like, did you find something? Because tell me and ban me. And he was like, that's not how it works around here. You know, if we found it, you'd be banned. So that was a huge relief for me because I carried that around for a while that um, mm. maybe I, maybe I wasn't always clean. It was a horrible feeling. It was such mm. a horrible feeling, but I, I feel good about it now. Mm -hmm. And was that like the process of being able to speak up about things like that and about the abuse that you underwent, you know, like, because you did have that fear that you could lose everything that you'd mm. worked so hard for, um, you know, kind of talk to listeners, maybe, you know, who are going through something in their own life. And they just think like, if I told the truth to people, then, you know, everything would be over. Like, how did you process that? Well, that fear is very real. I thought mm -hmm. a lot of things will keep an athlete silent, a clean athlete that witnessed something. Mm -hmm. Your reputation is going to go through the ringer. And I knew that everything that I accomplished under Alberto, there are still people who believe I was cheating when I accomplished it. Mm -hmm. And that'll keep you silent because you know how hard you worked and you know everything you sacrificed to accomplish those things. Also, once you say something publicly, you know, when I first went to USAD, I was still a Nike athlete. And I was like, if Nike finds out I'm here, I'm dead. I will lose everything. Um, but they kept it quiet, which was awesome. But mm -hmm. when I finally started to speak about it publicly, they have such a strong hold over our sport that there were races that told me I wasn't welcome there. There were meet directors that would openly shit talk me on websites. And so it's really, really hard. But at the end of the day, even people I thought were my friends would say she should give her medals back. She should, mm -hmm. you know, take herself out of the results. Um, and all of that was awful. But the thing was that by staying silent, I felt like I was part of the problem. I was allowing it to continue. And that made me feel culpable. That made me feel like I'm part of the problem. I'm helping them screw athletes out of Olympic team spots and world championship spots. And so 
at the end of the day, it was more important that I wasn't a part of the problem anymore than people questioned me and my reputation. And that doesn't Mm. mean it was easy. It was awful. But I sleep really well at night because I know I did the right thing. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you mentioned that there's a lot of cheating that goes on in our sport. I know. I'm like, but I still love it. Don't worry, guys. (laughs) (laughs) You have, you have a lot of reasons to, to not love it, um, and to walk away from it, but you still love to run. And I guess most recently, you know, you've had some, some, some struggles with your health. Maybe Angie, you can ask about the the last question. Yeah. In 2021, you were struggling with your balance and were finally diagnosed with focal dystonia. Um, so for people who've never heard what that is, can you tell us about it and, you know, what you're doing to manage it so that you can continue doing what you love? Yeah. The first doctor that diagnosed me with it, I didn't, I go, well, what is that? Like I had never heard of it that I, you know, I was there for a couple hours. I'm crying. He's like, well, you might not run again, but don't worry. It won't kill you. And I'm like, no, you don't understand. That's basically death for me, you know? Um, (laughs) and he was super, super nice, but I just didn't even know what it was. So then Mm -hmm. Adam and I, we were down pretty far in Denver. So we were driving back to Boulder and I'm like Googling it and I keep writing just dystopia because instead of dystonia, because I don't know what this is. Right. It feels like dystopia though. (laughs) Like, like, what is this? Um, and I stumbled across a runner's world article and as, and I was like, he's wrong. I don't have this. I don't, you know, I don't have a neurological disorder. This is, uh, but I stumbled across this runner's world article that night and I was like, oh yeah, no, I have this. But then I still went and got a second opinion at the Mayo Clinic, which was pretty mm-hmm. devastating because the doctor there was a bit harsher and was like, I think you need to be done running. This could spread through your body. You wouldn't be able to walk. Is that the life you want? And I was like, well, no. Uh, but fortunately, mm-hmm. and I, he was, he was a great guy, but, but mm-hmm. the cool thing is my doctor here, Dr. Jill Olson was like, he doesn't know you. He right. doesn't know that you used to run 135 miles a week and like it. You know what I mean? <laughs> <laughs> She's like, no, you're probably not going to run 135 miles a week, but. Seems like he could have just Googled you, you know? <laughs> yeah, he did not know who I was, but that's fine. Um, but she was like, let's fight for this. Let's fight for what we can get back. So mm-hmm. it's been about a year now that I've been treated. I have been on a couple different Parkinson's medications, one which really has helped me, but also this is kind of embarrassing, but it causes brain fog. And one of my jobs mm. is to talk on live television. So mm. I've kind of weaned myself from it, but I take it just once a day before I exercise now where I used to take mm. it multiple times a day. Um, and that was scary. Cause I was like, I don't want to lose function. Uh, but also <laughs> I would, I was so tired of every time I'd say something, my husband or son would go, you mean blah, blah, blah. And I was like, ah, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, so I, I am still taking that, but just sparingly now. I've been getting mm. Botox injections. I just had my fourth round. So essentially with dystonia, the brain can't stop telling the muscle to fire. And mm. so that's why your leg, your foot is coming through and it's like kind of rigid and it's tripping you up. Um, and the Botox disrupts that signal. So I still mm. don't have the function of my leg, but it's not stiff. And then I, and so that I had been doing, I've been doing that for a year. And then recently I started adding some new things this fall. I started adding hardcore, like strength training throughout my whole body, because even when I do run and I feel great, I look very different than I used to. My form has changed. And Mm. so making sure everything is strong so I don't get a compensatory injury. And then I just started PT with an actual, I didn't even know this existed neurological PT. And it's more (laughs) brain exercises than anything because with dystonia, um, brain wires get crossed. And then I'm also talking to this doctor in California about perhaps doing some deep brain therapy. So I'm trying a lot of things, but I'm trying to try them all in like three month chunks so that I know Mm -hmm. what worked and what didn't. Um, Mm -hmm. But I ran 40 miles last week. Wow. And so it's not, you know, I I would like more, but I'm also trying to live in a space of that's running. That's actually Mm -hmm. getting out and running. And uh, I still can't run on pavement, which is frustrating because I'd like to be able to run boulder boulder with my son in may but you know baby Mm. steps i'm definitely a lot better than i was a year ago wow hey are you gonna be at the boulder thon probably yeah boulder thon okay is it coming up (laughs) no it's not till like the fall oh okay because they do a bunch of races but that one's in the fall okay Mm -hmm. (laughs) you mentioned um tv um i was gonna say that we really enjoyed your commentary at the tokyo olympics Mm -hmm. during the marathon Thank Color you. Commentary. Well, it, it was pretty easy when Molly Seidel was in a position to get a medal. <laughs> it was like, yeah, 
It was exciting. After that race, that was the first marathon I ever called because the men's was the second day. And, okay. um, you know, I was nervous. It's a long time to fill airspace and I just hadn't done it yet. But thanks to Molly, it was like the easiest gig ever because it was just so exciting. And yeah. obviously when you're calling the Olympics, you're, you're, you're team world, not team USA, but it helped mm. me to like really have my energy <laughs> up the whole time. That's Your enthusiasm definitely came through and, you know, like being a runner, you can kind of tell when someone is really engaged in, you know, in the commentary and, you know, it just adds great anecdotes and what it's like to yeah. be out there. So yeah. Thank you. It's really fantastic to see you there at NBC Sports. And yeah, you're going to keep doing more TV work. Yeah, I'm pretty sure unless this book gets me fired, um, I'm pretty <laughs> sure I'm good through Paris 2024. And, you know, I, I have to say when you retire as a competitive athlete, I've never retired officially because I just think mm -hmm. that's crazy. Like, what if I want to go run a race? Who cares? Mm -hmm. um, but I think there is, and I felt this, I think, and you guys read the book, I felt like, what is my worth now? I've spent mm -hmm. 20 some years just focusing on training and being that best athlete I can be like, what? I don't have any skills, you know? Um, and so this job with NBC has made me feel like I have purpose and I love running. And even though, you know, I've had some really crappy experiences and I know the darker side of the sport, I still can get in that mindset of me being 14, watching Lynn Jennings and I love it. And so being able to commentate has made me feel like I have purpose and I really, really enjoy it. It makes me feel like I get to keep living my love of the sport. So mm -hmm. it's been really fun. And plus the podcast that you co-host, the Clean Sport Collective, and now um, Nobody Asked Us with Des Linden. Wow. So I think, you know, you've got a lot on your plate. I mean, plus, you know, another book here. So yeah, yeah. you it's know, funny. your skills are being put into. <laughs> <laughs> you ask my son, what does your mom do for a living? He's like a million things. She has a million jobs. <laughs> and I'm like, none of them are that big. But yes, I loved, I will, I hope to be involved in the sport until the day I die. I just love mm -hmm. the sport so much. And I know what it can do for you. And I know what it can do for people and how it can change their lives. Cause it's completely changed mine. And even though some of it was negative, the overwhelming part of it has just been amazing and positive. So I'm going to, I hope to be like my grandpa in my eighties running yes. on an alter G and calling my <laughs> grandchild. We'll be like, yeah, grandma, we know. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. By that it. time, every runner will have one yes, in their house. Everyone will have, you know, we used to have one when I was a part <laughs> of the organ project. And then when I left, they told me I could keep it. And mm -hmm. so but when we moved, when I, so when I was running for Schumacher, I had one in our house. And then when we left to move here, we just, we couldn't move it. We, and we were moving into a little apartment and everything. And so we gifted it to the, um, Bowerman track club, but I got to say, sometimes I wish I still had that <laughs> I know. a lot of sure times really actually, <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, sure it would be fun to feel fast again and take 30 pounds off and let it rip. But yeah, don't have it anymore. I haven't had it for a long time. <laughs> oh, well, we really enjoyed the book and this and time talking with you. And we encourage yeah. everyone to run out, literally run out and get the longest race there. You're going to love it. And it's going to yeah. be so informative for people. So, yes. And when you, when you said the book might get you fired, I think now people need to go read it, <laughs> see what's in it. That's right. Yeah. It's funny. It's, it's all the, it's the truth. It's what I experienced mm -hmm. from my own words and you know, somebody asked me, is the book controversial? And I said, no, it's, it's only controversial if you think I'm lying. Mm -hmm. And then I guess it's controversial. But the reality is this is what I lived through. This is what I experienced. And I'm hoping that by putting this out there, the next generation knows they don't have to put up with that kind of behavior, knows that they can mm -hmm. be believed, knows that it's not their fault if something happens. And literally I say this, and I, but I genuinely mean it. I will fight for you. I will fight for you. Yeah. Awesome. Well, if people want to connect with you online, Kara, where can we send them? Um, Instagram or Twitter is where I do the most active. I don't actually mm -hmm. take DMs because it's too much. But if you want to talk to me and you write, can I please talk to you about something? I will. And, and you say, I'm going to DM you. I will follow up with you. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, if you DM me on Facebook or Instagram or whatever, and you think I'm an a-hole for never responding. I just don't 
take DMs, <laughs> but I will. It would be too important. overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I really, if you want to talk to me, you can talk to me. But I do respond to, um, I do read almost, maybe I won't this week, just depending on feedback, but I usually do read all of the comments on Instagram and try to, and try to connect with people because I think, you know, social media is a whole nother talk topic and a whole nother podcast we could do. Mm, but wow. the good part about it is you can really connect with people. And I you really try to use, especially my Instagram as a tool to connect with people. Mm. What's the, what's the Instagram handle? Um, Kara Goucher at both Twitter and Instagram. Just my name Perfect. smooched together. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. All right. Everyone check out the longest race. Kara, it's been an honor to speak with you. Thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. Thank you so much for the respectful dialogue. I appreciate it. This has been fun.